welcome to Magic on Barcelona. I see a lot of people here on the seats for our next panel, a journey to remember art adventures in Middle Earth. And no one better to introduce you the rest of the guests and to host this panel. I want to hear the public cheer for Sam Gallio. Yeah. Have a good panel. Hello, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. My name is Sam. I run the YouTube channel Ristic Studies. And yeah, thank you. Um, honored. Um, and my channel looks at the art and the history and the culture of magic. And specifically today, we're looking at world building. We're looking at concept art. We're looking at illustration all the way from the beginning to the very ends, the images you see on the cards. I get so excited about this panel because my goal, our goal, is for you to all leave with a couple of pieces of trivia that, uh, that you only learn here, and then also get an idea of just how collaborative and how much time and effort um, it takes to, to put together a magic set. So today's topic is the Lord of the Rings, and I have four people on this panel with me that are going to I just, I just can't wait to talk to them. They're going to blow your mind. So please, without further ado, please welcome to the stage a nice big warm welcome for Ovidio Cartagena, Gray Highsmith, Tyler, uh, Tyler Jacobson, and Magali Villeneuve. OK, so this team, I'm going to let Ovidio uh, introduce you to who is here, and it's because it's a bit of a tongue-in-cheek kind of nice yeah. jab in the ribs. So please, Ovidio, this is Ovidio Cartagena. Who, who are we working with here? So, uh, Lord of the Rings required an epic undertaking. So, like Gandalf, I needed a fellowship, <laughs> right? Uh, part of that fellowship is here. Uh, so we have Tyler Jacobson, the humble king, <laughs> <laughs> the epic <laughs> artist. Gray Highsmith, the brave hobbit, <laughs> <laughs> Frodo, and Magali Villeneuve, the perfect warrior, Legolas. <laughs> and of course, I have to ask who you are. Uh, well, Gandalf, of okay. course, right? <laughs> Putting together the, the fellowship. And um, who can I be on the fellowship? We didn't rehearse this, so I wonder. All right, <laughs> let's, let's, let's take a look at it. Um, Sam. Oh, who yeah. else? <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Fine enough. <laughs> Okay, so uh, Ovidio was the art director for this set. He's been working on it forever, it seems. Years ago it started, it was in development and production. Um, and I kind of want to know, just from a high level, what were, what were the goals for this set specifically? The last time we did this panel, it was for Phyrexia All Will Be One, and those goals were way different than something like The Lord of the Rings. So tell me, what, what was the concept and what was the high level um, goals for this set? So I started thinking about Lord of the Rings around 2019. Yeah. Like, I, I will say the last quarter of 2019 has been a long time. And I had some time to prepare. Um, it, I, first, of course, I had to go to the literature and be faithful to the books, read them, take everything in, uh, and try to purge myself of a any, any preconceptions I had. Right? I wanted to bring something new to something new to this. I wanted to impress fans. I wanted to endear fans. I wanted to give everyone a new way to visualize the epic story we all love and also inspire people to go back to the books, right? Because when you're playing the cards, it feels like the story. It feels very flavorful and I wanted the art to inspire people to, to come to see the books in a new light. And I, I'll tell you, reading Lord of the Rings, thinking about how I would do this, it was very inspiring, very immersive. It, it made it even more alive. And then the art started coming in, right? Like we started with the concept art, and the art started coming in. I think we can see the next slide, which is one of my favorite pieces. Yeah. Uh, I remember uh, Tyler designed uh, Aragorn, and this illustration by Yonggi Choi. I shared it with Tyler, and <laughs> and he was like, "This, this is a, yeah. this is a masterpiece. Like this is just incredible." Yonggi just knocked that out of the park. Very inspiring image. 
Um, but what I wanted was, I came up with, and the story fed me this, four pillars of philosophy. So I wrote documents of the philosophy of each of the groups, like how do dwarves think, how do elves think, how, does, how do Gondorians think, how does everyone think here? And uh, the four pillars are, and, and each of us represents that here too in the panel. So there's many people who contributed, but symbolically. Yeah. Uh, the first pillar was the epic. Every event in Lord of the Rings is larger than life. When it, uh, whether it's, it is a battle or a feat of courage and love, it's large. It, it, it inspires us to be greater than we think we are. And we realize that we can reach that greatness. Uh, the second, I think we can just keep seeing the, uh, the imagery. The second one was the legendary. Uh, and the legendary is this whole world is lived in. It has a whole fully fledged history. People have inhabited it. And once you step into Middle Earth, everywhere you go, there's a story, there's a song that tells you where you are and who has tread here, right? And that the, the third one is the storytelling, yeah. right? Every piece of art, every illustration has to have that dynamic between characters. Who is going where? Who is talking to who? How are people feeling? And what do they want to achieve? Uh, and the last one, it, my favorite, it's the pastoral. Uh, the pastoral is the idyllic life that hobbits live. And there's a, it's very important that this is told first to us because that's the ideal state of life. And that's the state of life that the characters, at least the good ones in Lord of the Rings, the, the, the free peoples, that's what they want to get back to. We all want to get back to second breakfast. We don't want to fight forever. <laughs> yeah. War is something, war is a tragedy that is necessary. It's a hurdle that we have to get through so that we can live the comfort of home, the love of your friends. Uh, I think we can see the, uh, the picture for Bag End. Uh, and the, the, what hobbits love. Yeah. And with that, that aspect was uh, embodied and represented very well by the concept art that Gray made. Yeah. Uh, we could take a look at the next slide. Yeah. So um, as the video was saying, if you remember the Lord of the Rings, I think the happiest moments always are at the very beginning of this very long epic journey. And it starts with home, that feeling of home. And that feeling of home means something slightly different depending on where you're from. but. It comes back to physical comforts, and the hobbits are all about physical comfort. What I love about the, specifically about the people on this panel is we have a wide range of folks like Tyler and Ovidio who are the sickos who know every word that <laughs> Tolkien has ever written and can read the Silmarillion backwards in their sleep, right? You know, these people, they get obsessed forever. And he, he's, he's like smug about it. He's like, yeah, that's me, you know? <laughs> In Quenya. Yeah. And we have that. And then it goes all the way to folks who are just discovering the, the stories for the first time. And that's where Gray is set, right? So Gray, talk to me at the very beginning. You were brought on this project. And you meet Ovidio, who is ready to quote uh, a passage from, you know, page 297 of Two Towers, right? <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. So um, what, was that, what was that meeting like? So I was an intern at the time, um, and I learned that I was going to be on this project. And I had this meeting with Ovidio where it was like a two-hour long meeting where he explained, like, here is the world building of the Lord of the Rings, like, books. Because I had never read the books. I hadn't seen the movies at that point. Um, and he just went through the entirety of the plot and, like, the world building. And I was like, OK, I need to do this justice because it's one of those IPs that people care so much about that you know I don't want to like come in here without any knowledge and mess it up. So I did do some research ahead of time. Um, had a little bit of time. I think this was a couple weeks before the concept first started where you were like, OK, here's the art we have for the fellowship. Like, Get that in your head before you watch the movies. And you know, we'll go from there. Um, but yeah, it was really interesting coming in without an idea of what the movies looked like already. 
uh, to sort of be able to, to find a different approach that we haven't seen before, because um, I don't already have that in my mind. So what about this image? What, what, what are you working with at the very beginning to try to depict this feeling of the hobbits being home and comfortable? Yeah, it was very important. I was drawn to the hobbits partially because they felt very familiar and approachable. Mm. Um, I remember being in a meeting fairly early on where Tyler had made like this weapon sheet. And he was talking about like, okay, well I made this this way because of all of these influences and all of these things. And I made this like individual named weapon, I forget which one. <laughs> like this because it was made 10,000 years before all of those and they wouldn't have had all this info. I was like, oh my God, like, <laughs> shit, man. <laughs> I, I, don't, I can't compete with that. Um, so the Hobbits felt very familiar to me already, kind of. Um, so no, I, I wanted that to come through the kind of, they care about comfort. You know, yeah. they care about things that are well-made and decorated, but functional and... You know, I, yeah, know so I kept coming back to comfort. Yeah, so what about um, giving them some clothing? What are the items that they're holding? What are they, what are they embodied with? Because this, this, this is the type of concept arts that um, comes from the concept push that then later is interpreted by an illustrator to put on the final card. So, so what are we looking at in terms of the hobbits in that, in that regard? Yeah, so we wanted their co clothing to be very, very comfortable. Um, we were working with like trying to figure out color palettes and things. We're like, okay, they're gonna be green, white mostly. So let's lean into that. Like we talked about like natural dyes that they might have available to them because um, they care about nature. And so you know, what can they find in the world around them that they can use in their clothing? And we talked about decoration and like what kind of decoration they might want to have, what inspiration they might draw from um, in order to make their clothes. But at the top of that list kind of was we wanted them to be comfortable. We wanted them to look like they were comfy. It's important to them. And uh, I think the next one is a piece by Jonas. Uh, the, the next environment, the next slide. Uh, just, uh, oh no, it's uh, the, the Constantine Maran uh, interpretation, very good. So you notice all the patchwork? Like we wanted, it has a dual purpose, right? Like we wanted them Yes, they love the comfort of home. It, it looks like you want to go there and just have your, uh, write your novel, <laughs> nice. the, the novel you want to write there. But also all the crops indicate the food, right? It was, it was the food token connection for hobbits. Mm. So it, it, it served a dual purpose. And I, I want people, I will call attention to the next painting by Campbell, where there's a very important element that shows up across cards. <laughs> Great, <laughs> tell us about it. <laughs> I had forgotten that I did this until you mentioned it like a few weeks ago. The pan that he is holding <laughs> is from the concept push. I designed a bunch of props uh, for the hobbits because they have a bunch of stuff in their houses. You need to put stuff in the houses um, if we're showing the interiors and furniture and things. So that pan <laughs> yeah. it, it, shows you'll up see across a, a few uh, cards, uh, I think. Look for it because we... We put, they put it in, in many briefs, like you'll see it in Build a Pony, you'll see it, it's the same pan, like, <laughs> throughout, like, even as, a, even as an artifact. Uh, I think we can see the food, to the food slide, yeah. and the next one, I think. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so this is uh, this has now become colloquially known as the one pan to fry them all. Yeah. Uh, exactly. This came from Gray. Gray, I, this this kind of points to another part of your work, which is you have to think about the weapons that the hobbits might have or might not have. So how would hobbits get creative if suddenly there was a war in your backyard? You're in the middle of second breakfast on your way to <laughs> work on chapter six of your novel. What what happens when a fight breaks out with the hobbits? Yeah, Avidio and I had a whole meeting about this. During the concept push. Um, we were talking about it because it's not like they are, they have like a military, right, that is prepared to go to war. And so we were talking about what they might use to defend themselves. And it kind of came down to modifying farming tools, or maybe there's like a sword from six generations back that's in someone's attic that is maybe not in the best shape, but maybe is still functional. Um, and then hands, like <laughs> cooking tools, just stuff that you might have around the house that you could use in a pinch. Yeah. Wonderful. And then um, some of the costumes you mentioned, what, yep. are, the, what are the hobbits wearing? Like, what are they? What uh, are they I think we with? can look at the next couple of slides, I think. But uh, yeah, I think this is where we, this is, this is the piece by Jonas. Yeah. You, can, you can see how Constantine, he took a lot of inspiration from that. Um, 
so we came, it was hard for us to come to something that was familiar, comforting, and at the same time, uh, universally folkish. So we looked at some Bolivian ponchos, yeah, right? Yeah. And some Balkan vests. Mm -hmm. from, from the very first pieces I commissioned, when I was trying to start visualizing, we took the Balkan idea, we added the, 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 the ponchos, and it came together quite nice. You designed textiles for it. I did, yeah. I designed a yeah. bunch of textiles for the set. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the, you've designed textiles for a lot of the it's true. sets, so it, it's normally very good work. So uh, it, th that's how we came to Hobbits. It, it represented peoples that I admire, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, including some elements that might seem disparate, but they belong together, and they came together quite nicely in the set. I think that the hobbits uh, kind of in their own way have home written all over them and what they wear. They're not prepared for battle, as we said. Uh, they wear heavy drapery and they're immersed in the textures of the earth in which they live and inhabit. But the hobbits are not what, uh, you know, they're not the warriors that are fighting on the battlegrounds. I'd like to move to the second section here where we're going to speak about designing the heroes that we know by name, the legendary creatures. And what's important here is um, between Tyler and Magali, who have been on both sides of this process, you have the, um, the creative push and the concept push, like Gray was mentioning. So that begins, and then you pass it off. And for someone like Tyler in this set, it was cool to see Magali interpret his work and turn it into a hero. So that's our next step. So Magali, first, um, I'd like you to kind of speak about um, some, of the, some of the work that you had to do for the packaging materials for this to yeah. really sell the heroic side. If we have the homey hobbits, now we have, to, we have to communicate that there is a lot of war going on. So talk to me a little bit about this piece. Yeah, th this piece was made for as a key art, meaning that uh, it, it would be used for packaging, uh, for packaging mainly, because I, I think it's, uh, it, it appears in, uh, on the boxes. And uh, it's a different challenge from a card. That is, with such a piece, you have to, uh, you know, to give a general um, mood for the whole set. It's gonna, you know, set the tone for what's coming. So um, you, you you have to communicate that it's gonna be epic, and you have to also show clearly the heroes that the, the fans of the Lord of the Rings want to recognize. And on top of that, you have the, mo the more technical side. That is, you have to think about the template because it's going to be on a box and you're going to have, you know, all titles and mention and Magic the Gathering reader and, and so on and so on. And you still want the piece to look coherent and to look good even without all the titles and all. So th that's the main challenges, you know, the mood and also the composition. Yeah. And the Balrog scene is another one that came up in the packaging. And this scene I loved because it's immediately oh, yeah. recognizable. Like, this is the Lord of the Rings, capital Lord, uh, capital Rings, right? So, Magali, what were, you, um, what were you thinking about for motifing or for posing or for colors for this piece? Yeah, th that was a major challenge because there is a sense of scale. It is very important because, you know, it's a Balrog. It has to be massive. But I didn't have that much room to work to work with, still uh, for the same reason as the previous piece, for because you know I had to think about the titles and I had I had to think about everything and all, but I still wanted to you know uh, I I wanted the audience to feel the heat in all the blue you know and uh, I wanted I really wanted it to be really eye catching and uh, th that was the main goal and uh, that's really a piece that is dear to me because it was a really challenging one. I worked with Mary Hall, the art director for the, this piece, and uh, she's a very bold art director because, you know, I'm not really known as a creature maker. I'm, I think, if you know my cards, I'm more about humanoids in general. And uh, when I received this commission, it was a honor because, I mean, this, the Balrog and Gandalf, I mean, what can you dream of after that? And I said, OK, she thinks I can do it. So I really, I really did my best to do something epic and to make a Balrog that, that would be, you know, at, as it's supposed to be, frightening and impressive and all. So it's really something, you know, that's one of these moments when you, you try to push the envelope and try to go beyond your comfort zone. So I'm, I'm really happy with the way it came out in the end. And so many of these scenes do tell stories in and of themselves, which I know Magic is always trying to do, but because it does come from an actual story, uh, a scene like this 
captures all of the sort of emotional drive and the and the climax of that narrative moment when Gandalf has to sacrifice himself to 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 save the fellowship. So all, a lot of scenes that come up on cards and in box arts are are really like little vignettes, if if you will. And this is kind of a good example of that. Now let's just, play ping pong. Yeah. I just wanted to add the Balrog does not have wings. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> no wings. Again, pa which no page wings is that? Do you, which page of which book is? <laughs> let's let's uh, <laughs> let's, let's talk about uh, <laughs> the Rohirrim. <laughs> yes, yeah, sure. But sure. I wanted to remind people, like, it's just very important to us. We were really inspired in the simile rather than a literal interpretation. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Beautiful. So, um, so Jesper Ising is an artist who is here in the hall. We were talking yes. a bit earlier. He's a, as you mean, commander player. So if you want to get a game in, he would love to destroy you. <laughs> um, Jesper works with Tyler often, uh, and you know Jesper pretty well. So yeah. kind of speak to me. We're going to play ping pong and go back to the concept side. What is going on with these, um, with these characters, and what is the goal for you when you're designing at the concept level, Tyler? Uh, the the Rohirrim was great because this was sort of like our starting point, I think, early on in the video, where we were trying to see what we could really own for Magic the Gathering. Like, what can Magic own about this space? Um, so we, we came into, well, actually, we tried a lot of stuff to begin with. Um, and eventually, Jesper came up with this particular plate that you guys can see over there of um, sort of doubling down on this motif of a horse culture. How do we celebrate them as a horse culture? And, um, this, he had this brilliant solution of creating braids that come down all of their uh, jackets and all of their cloaks. And I was bringing in, and a lot of my design work was kind of a video, and I talked a lot about, like, they're kind of two great horse cultures in the history. You know, we have the Comanche and the Mongols. We have two massive horse cultures. And we wanted to try and find a way to blend those together, as opposed to you know, the way a lot of people have seen Rohirrim in the past is very Viking-inspired. Um, um, so we changed that up a little bit. We wanted to go a different route. But we had a, a Viking, uh, Jesper Ising. <laughs> um, we, he, we used his uh, sensibilities to, to come to this conclusion. This became, this particular plate became the, the, our entire inspiration for how we were going to develop uh, Rohan yeah. throughout the set. Um, so this was a perfect touchstone that led us into the design work that I did with AON and, and other characters in that setting. Wonderful. Um, we can move to the next one. And this is the AON plate. Yeah. So this was one of my favorite characters in the story. And I really wanted to give her some gravitas, some weight, some power, but also allude to the fact that she is a noble, she's of a noble house. So she's kind of got wealthier armor. And, and then the construction, as you can see in her dress, we've we used a little, some Mongolian inspiration as to how they crafted their um, leather plate work. And, and then she has her braided motif in her own hair, as well as her um, jacket. But the other thing I really wanted to double down on was the horse motifing. So we looked at a lot of ways um, scale armor is constructed in various cultures. And, and I built this sort of double horse head that became a motif that actually came into Mogali's painting as well. So. This is, a, as you alluded to earlier, this is like a, a great moment where I get to design a character with my own sensibilities, and then I get to hand it off to an amazing artist that's going to make it come to life and, and look wonderful. So and that, it turned I love into this, uh, it turned into this like epic flowing piece. Yeah. I, I, we can see it in the following this slide. Is, yeah, this yeah. Is yeah. I, yeah, I remember writing Magali about this. I was like, oh my god. I, Really looking forward to how it comes out. And Magali, what uh, what did you feel? What did you think about uh, Tyler's design? Yeah, um, y you know, one of the major skills to have um, as a magic artist is being able to start from a concept design. You can see in the world guide we are being given as a reference, and uh, and then after that you have to bring something. Uh, more personal to that, but I got to say that when I discovered the Eowyn in the in the guide, uh, first ju just like you, uh, she, she she's really one of my all-time favorite characters, um, and uh, also I have to say that I have a personal affinity with Tyler's work, which means that I 
immediately knew it was his design, uh, this AON, and I was even more happy to be working on that because, I mean, it's such a clever design and it's really expressive and also I was really excited to get the, the, this commission. What I tried to bring on top of the original wonderful design was uh, something I, I tried to uh, include in all of my card art for the set that is uh, a more classical approach. First of all, because you know, uh, classic art is my main source of inspiration. So it was for me a really good occasion to try to, to use that type of references. And also because for me, The Lord of the Rings is you know, a timeless masterpiece. So I think that what's better, um, the best starting point possible to work on that type of set was you know, classical art because it is timeless. So for this Eowyn, I think it shows that is, I went for like a, like a Baroque approach, you know, to have the feeling that you are looking at, you know, an old painting from a very old, but a story that existed, you know, and uh, this is like a, a remain of a long gone epic battle. And I like it, there's two, cup, there's two details that sort of emerge. One, again, from the concept plate that Tyler was speaking about, the scale armor that is two horse heads opposing themselves one another so you see that in the in the the sort of the neck of the the horse and along the scales of um, Eowyn's armor so that motif comes through and those are those tiny details that get lost at card level but every time I speak with the concept artist this is they want to ground all the even the tiniest materials of what the leather is made of that comes through in these guides and then the other is is one that no one would ever catch, but it's floating in the background. Uh, gray, this is another sneaky, you know, <laughs> sneaky yeah. gray action. Yeah, I, after the push ended, um, we realized that we didn't have symbols for the factions, and we needed to have symbols for the factions so that they could have, like, flags and banners and stuff. And so I designed this little, like, woven-looking horse because of all of the stuff that Jesper had done where we decided that, like, all the braids and stuff. And so you can see it in so many places. It's on their shields, it's on banners and stuff. And every time I see it in the card, I'm like, oh, it's there. <laughs> yeah. It's super, super cool as a concept artist to be able to pick out stuff like that. I'm like, ah, oh, I did that little thing, that little tiny piece of this incredible piece of art. Like, ah, oh, they looked at the thing that I did and they put it in there. It's awesome. So those are the Rohirrim. Let's look at the elves. Uh, Tyler, what's, what were some big motifs and some important moments for, um, for the elf design? Um, we had actually talked a lot about how we were going to um, build their world. Uh, you know, the, the biggest challenge in developing this set was the fact that we couldn't make it look like any other version of The Lord of the Rings, right? So I grew up with Ralph Bakshi's Lord of the Rings from the late 70s and the Rankin and Bass Hobbit, and then later in my life, the, the Weta workshop, Peter Jackson, Lord of the Rings. So we're all very familiar with what elves should look like because we've been sort of, I don't know, our, our brains have been locked into this particular view of, of what elves are. So we wanted to bring in sort of a very fresh, new, more inspired look, I think is what we were after, to, to give it a feeling of that Middle Earth is more diverse than it's been shown to be. Um, so we wanted to, we, we actually looked at a lot of um, Chinese designs. Yeah, Chinese um, fantasy, like the we, historical we, movies. And yeah, because there's like, the elves are an old culture in Middle Earth, and you know what's one of the oldest cultures on Earth is the Chinese culture. So we thought that we could give them a sense of um, this ancient tapestry of, of um, woven clothing. So we, we use a lot of those designs, and I, you went with Jihan a lot on on this, and yes, maybe, maybe you could talk about uh, that a little bit. They had um, two things on one side of their on on the inside of the clothing, the lining has the patterns of waves of the sea. And on the outside, you see star charts, the, the tracking of the stars. They were very connected to these two things. Mm. Uh, but one more thing that I wanted was every time you see elves, their, their clothes are flowing as if they're walking inside water. And so I, I remember asking for that several times, like, no, more floaty, more floaty, more more of this, and I, I ended up making this sketch to, like as a guidance in the world guide, just to see how, how their clothing would look. And it informed, this went into, uh, into every elf card we did, right? But we're going to talk about Magali's piece. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and Magali, uh, you again, you take this and you're, their shape language is, okay, they are ethereal and they are watery and now you have a big name character that you also have to kind of bring to life. So Galadriel, talk to me about Galadriel. Yeah, once again, I've been really spoiled in this set because I got to work on some major characters, that's a thing, but also characters that I really do love. And this Galadriel in particular, I can say it, this time it was comfort zone. That is a woman that is, you know, a really flowy design to work from and all. For Galadriel, I had also the honor to be designing uh, the way she was gonna look. So I could start from the concepts you could see just before to know the general idea that was expected from uh, for else. And she had to be like, you know, uh, the perfect synthesis of what these elves were supposed to look because she's, she's a queen. So I could, you know, I could let myself, let my imagination run free and just, uh, uh, you know, it was such a great starting point to have, you know, uh, this flowing uh, fabric and this flowing hair. And this also allows the character to, you know, to, to fill in the space around her. Yeah. Like, I mean, uh, like the, the wonderful queen she is. So yeah, that was really, really a, a, a fun piece. And uh, yeah, yeah, I, I really love uh, the idea you had for the elves. It's so fresh and, uh, and expressive. You see in the, blink, in the blink of an eye that they are powerful and spiritual. And we see the, the magic of Galadriel, because what, that was another thing of the, the, the set is that magic is real. You should be able to see the magical effect and you put it on the edges, right? Like, it looks like the reflected light on waves. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how her magic mm. is just starting to gather because yeah. that, she is a quiet storm, mm. exactly. right? Exactly. Uh, and yeah, I remember receiving the sketch. My answer was, approved. <laughs> <laughs> yep, no notes. Uh, Ovidio <laughs> talks about how a lot of the front of the work of course, it's arduous and it's difficult, but then the Christmas time is when you receive emails and yes. you open the email and it's like, okay, everything came together. Like, yes. we're good, you know. <laughs> Trust in the hands of brilliant artists. Um, I'd like to look at Gandalf. I mean, Gandalf really is, to me, the other side of the hobbits. He is the hobbit that leaves the Shire and knows all of the world. He is, again, a, a grounding character for the story. He is the moral center, and Gandalf has to also evolve. Um, this version, Gandalf the Grey, also carries a few notes from the books, but a new interpretation. So Tyler, what were you looking at with, um, with this one? Yeah, this was a, that situation that Ovidio and I talked about a lot from earliest talks about the, working on this set was, we're gonna go back to the source material in most, as many cases as we can. And we, again, just like the elves, we all have this particular look for Gandalf. You know, he's a big, tall wizard with a giant beard and He's a tall wizard. Well, if we go back to the source material, he's not a tall wizard. He's actually a very, he's a little bit taller than Gimli. He's a short, very short little guy. He has that kind of, you know, to forgive the Star Wars reference, but he's that Yoda style. He's a small character that has great big energy um, and he's a very powerful being. So we, I wanted to get that in. I wanted to get that feeling of his smallness, but, um, that will give, you know, later on in the set when you see him on the cards, he's actually a big, huge, powerful, and intense wizard. Um, but, you know, the other thing that kept getting hammered at us was um, Jesper kept pointing out the fact in the books his, he's described as having eyebrow hair that goes beyond his brim of his hat. And so we're like, okay, so we can't do a big, giant hat. We need to go back to the source material and give him sort of a smaller brimmed hat and all these little details. But um, I was trying to give him also some like South Pacific Islander influences to more like an old Maori wizard, I guess, was kind of what I was going for. Um, so those are like the early things. And then, then what beautifully happened is we got to hand off this idea to Magali, who gets, is now going to make our Gandalf the White, the great new version of yeah. Gandalf. Oh, yeah. yeah, so uh, did you guys know that you would come to a panel and learn about Gandalf's eyebrows? Right? I told you, this is <laughs> details. And uh, you get to brag about them. Um, obviously, Gandalf becomes, he ascends in many ways. You have to capture this glory and this essence of, of a very powerful, magical wizard. So what's the difference uh, about this versus the Galadriel piece? And what, what, um, what would you like to share about Gandalf? Well, no, it, it was pretty much the same type of a work. 
That is, you start from the guide and you start from the, the mood, the concept artist tried to give for the character. And then in this case, uh, the challenge was to show the, the white version. That is that moment when he becomes, you know, more, you know, ethereal in a way also. And you can see really his true power coming through. So um, the, I would say that the, a, a big challenge, especially with that character, is to forget that the fans are going to be looking at your illustration. Because everybody knows what a Gandalf is, and everybody has an idea about how he's supposed to look. And if you start thinking about it too much, maybe you're a bit less creative, and maybe you, you, know, you can get to, you know, to um, you tend to worry about what people are going to think about him. Mm. So yeah, I prefer to concentrate once again, as I did for Eowyn, by the way, about uh, the impression I wanted to give and how I wanted to communicate his power. And again, I went for you know the classical approach, like he was. Uh, he has to. He had to look iconic, and that's the best way I knew how to do with a very vertical composition and with a really you know calm and composed attitude that is he knows what he's doing and he has no doubt he's gonna succeed and uh, yeah that was the main challenge also I'm forgetting there was a challenge of the of the eyebrows yes <laughs> because I, I remember I did receive a note about that can you exaggerate a little the eyebrows <laughs> Okay, I see. It's important, so let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> so there was one note on on Gandalf the White, yeah. right? Yeah, his <laughs> eyebrows, right? Okay, so the Lord of the Rings. We start with the Hobbits. We develop the legendary characters. Of course, like any great story, you have to make them collide. And the absolute climax of the Lord of the Rings is the Battle of the Pelennor Fields. And any version you've ever seen of this story, the Battle of the Pelennor Fields, is the biggest moment in the story in many ways. It's where everything comes together. So a year ago, Ovidio and I were in Las Vegas, and we did a panel like this, and we ended with this piece. And we finally, we've been biting our tongues for a year. We finally get to talk about the Battle of the Pelennor Fields. And basically, all you wanted was for this to be epic. And you have, you have to kind of convince Tyler, like, hey, I got an idea. Like, what if, right? So yes, I. Tyler, all you need to do is the best, most ambitious painting <laughs> of magic, the gathering. Ever. It's, uh, it's a short phrase. <laughs> it's a simple top line. No, uh, the reality was uh, I wanted to get Tyler to do an illustration for the set. And Tyler's schedule is busy. So I, I had to find a way to, to bring him in and, and have us work together on one last, like, great boom, you know? So when we came up with uh, the scenes, the first scene that I had in mind was the Pelennor Fields. Mm. And this has to be the biggest scene, 18 cards, and uh, Tyler is going to do it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> do you know? Did, yeah, did, did you talk to Tyler? No, <laughs> but 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 I was like, oh, hey Tyler, I got an, I have an idea. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what do you think about doing the Pelender Fields? And we went for a walk in uh, what's the name of that park? Seward Park. Seward yeah. Park in Seattle. Yeah, it's a forest. Uh, it's kind of like a peninsula. Yeah. Like a little peninsula. We went inside the forest. We spent a few hours just talking about the composition, the story. About the commission, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. We talked business for a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> but it was more like, uh, I think our initial adventure into this little idea <laughs> that became a huge idea was how were we going to depict it in this particular scenario. And I think uh, when we were on that walk talking about it, it was mostly about where we can set the camera. Like, where do we place the camera in order to show all of the things that we want to show in this particular scenario? Um, and all of the moments, you know, it's, it's almost like this image is, uh, you know, something you would see in a church of, you know, an, in like a historical religious moment in the in Middle Earth, right? Because it's, it's combining a bunch of story moments that didn't 
weren't happening all at the same time. So we were like cheating a lot of things. We had to cheat the horizon line. Like how can we see Minas Tirith and Baradur at the same time? So we're kind of like pushing them closer together a little bit. There was a lot of playing around with things that would be considered canonical that we kind of had to break in order to make this work. Um, and that was, I, I think, our initial chats. And then I, yep. what you see here is me trying to figure out how we're going to fit everything in the right place. <laughs> At this point, you're suffering, right? Like, this is the beginning of a very long suffer. When we talked for the first time, I was like, we're going to talk Battle of Pelennor Fields, and Tyler's like, oh, baby, okay, let's try, <laughs> you know? Let's unpack it. Yeah, let's unpack <laughs> it. So let's get to the nitty-gritty. You go from this sketch, obviously from this sketch, stuff gets moved around. The next one is kind of a grayscale. Um, what's this process like juggling all of these characters and all these moments? Yeah, this was like the 18 the sided Rubik's Cube is what I was working with here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to, to try to fit everything in the right place. Luckily, we arrived in a situation where we had a horizon line. I, that was kind of what I needed to ground everything. And based on where we're seeing in this image, the horizon had to be really high. So essentially the camera's looking down on the field. Um, and that, that got us into the situation of what's our centerpiece along the top, what's our centerpiece along the middle, and what's our centerpiece along the bottom. So the top, obviously, is the Witch King. The middle is kind of two centerpieces, I'd say, you know, with the Rohan and, and Eowyn. And then Aragorn's a centerpiece along the bottom. Um, and I, from the get-go, I wanted to create one image as opposed to 18 images. Um, and that's why we have centerpieces and then sort of secondary focal points that become all the other cards. Um, and that's that was my solution for how the heck are we going to do 18 <laughs> cards in one place. Something I wanted to point out in your composition is like, pay attention to the dark areas. Like if you squint, you see a triangle of tone mm -hmm. going up, right? It's that like monolithic overarching shape that brings weight to the piece. Yeah, that's the, that's the main, like that's me treating it as a single image as opposed to yeah. 18 images. I wanted this triangular composition to, to, you know, it's a very classic way to compose a giant image is a big triangle. Yeah. And so I was building around that as, as our main story centerpiece. But as, as we went through it, I mean, if we go to the next slide, yeah, so as we went through it, we started to color key how we were going to make this work. And this actually, I got a lot of help from a video in this scenario because we have, you know, magic has colors, right? There's a Wooberg in magic. So we wanted to hit as many colors as we could in the, in the overall image. And it meant we had to kind of cheat gradients. You know, we had to have areas where it's sort of like, oh, it's more unnaturally red here than it would be, or it's unnaturally blue here where it wouldn't be. Um, we played around a lot with that. And then the other thing I started adding in, which you can kind of see along the bottom, is I wanted a little bit of story, um, sort of triangles of story. Um, so along the bottom, all the characters that we know very well, Aragorn, Legolas, Gimli, Merry, I have a little story going on there where, um, as, as we go into the next slide, you can see it as I tighten Oof. it up. Legolas is sort of like spinning this move where he's shooting all these orcs in an arc around him to protect his friends. But then the other stories are, you know, um, Eowyn preparing to, for her showdown with the Witch King as her eye line is kind of looking up towards the Witch King. Um, so all these little stories I was trying to tell in this moment of pure mayhem, which is this giant uh, but battlefield. But also the hope and the despair, yeah, yeah, right? Like you see hope and despair on both ends. Uh, I remember telling you like, hey, can we, like, can we make the clouds, like the, the, the dark clouds as if it's like a hand yeah. reaching into the, yeah, like, so, so that we can see like the hand of Aaron, so the hand of Aaron, the hand of, uh, the hand of uh, Sauron, because you see the eye of Sauron in the background and then you see the the these, clouds creeping in yeah, as it's tendrils Sauron's of reaching. Smoke. Yeah. 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 Yeah, this uh, this comes together with color, but like Tyler mentions, there's so many small stories that are four cards wide. Uh, the fellowship on the bottom, right above them, this triangle of the Witch King and Eowyn and the Rohirrim. And then off to the left is kind of the story of the smaller, you know, the the, the smaller armies that are fighting in the battle. 
What's important, we discussed this, we, what's important about this image is it's not a photograph of the actual battle. It's how someone would remember the battle and try to tell all the stories in one image. And even, again, the little details of knowledge, of knowing that the battle uh, that uh, moved from, from you know, the East against the West, uh, the free peoples of the West colliding with the East, that is also laid out in this image. Um, so before we conclude, I just... This was such a massive undertaking. Tyler's too humble, he'll never accept this, but please, can we just give him a round of applause for this? This is so sick. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It, was a, it was a wild one. Yeah. <laughs> I think, like, like I've mentioned a bunch of times, I, I don't do 18 cards for magic in a single year, yes. much less six months, which is what I have to do this in. And there are like, the, one other thing I wanted to mention yeah. was that there are like sacrificial moments in this because I knew there were text boxes that were going to run across huge areas of this painting. So I put the, right in the middle of the image is this huge troll, like ready to smash <laughs> everything, and uh, text runs right over him. So when you have all 18 cards, you don't even see that yeah. part of the painting. But I'm glad at we're all. showing it here. <laughs> yeah. But this goes, what you mentioned about the, hist the, the, the symbolic depiction is exactly, I re the very first conversation I had about Lord of the Rings with my boss, right? Like, so what do you want to do for Lord of the Rings? And I remember telling her, I want the whole set to feel like someone in Middle Earth commissioned hundreds of paintings mm. to commemorate the moments of the War of the Ring. I want this to feel like in world history because within the mythos of Lord of the Rings. This is our past. It's everyone's past, right? And I, in all the images we've seen today, I felt like that was achieved. It, it was encapsulated. Magali talked about the Baroque. Magali talked about the classical paintings. And we were talking about all these aspects, like how it would hang in a castle, right? Like, I wish I had a wall big enough to hold this image. Yeah. Um, I could make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a couple of investments. Or you, I mean, it's on 18 cards, you know. This is a game of magic. They're on well, cards. You can just... <laughs> you you got to make it big. That's true. Yeah, you got to make it Touché. large. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, so we have about 10 minutes for questions. That'll be about five or six questions. If you have any questions for the wonderful artists on this stage, go ahead and line up. But as you do that, please just give them all one more round of applause. It was my wonderful <laughs> honor to host them. So thank you so much. <laughs> Last year. Yes, please, go ahead. Uh, I'm just wondering about the ring treatment, the alternative ring treatment that you had, how you got there, and um, essentially. Yeah, what is, the, what is the exact question about how those came to be, or? Yeah, just how they came to be. I'm sure there was like variations of so all types of things. But yeah, yeah, I can answer that. Great. The, uh, the one ring you mean? Uh, no, sorry. Uh, you know the alternate Earth versions of the cards that they have, where they're in a ring and they have iconic moments. Oh, oh that, sure. was, uh, that was a, a beautiful idea by Tom, who I think Tom was in the last panel, yeah. right? Uh, it, it, it was how the ring can tempt the character. So it's as if you're looking through the ring into each character, right? Because it, it, the ring has a way of connecting with their, it's an entity in itself. And that, I remember seeing the, the first few arts coming together. I was very impressed. It, it's, it's Tom's project, and he really nailed the story. Yeah. Thank you very much. You got it. Thank you. David, please. Uh, <laughs> uh, first of all, I just wanted to congratulate everyone on this panel and who worked on, on this set because it's probably one of the best adaptations that has been made of Tolkien's work. So, congratulations, you guys. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, speaking of adaptations, uh, what's the equilibrium you guys have to take when uh, doing a, a, a new artwork and new art directions for a, a thing that's so widely known in, in popular culture? Uh, because, it, for example, uh, I'm thinking precisely of uh, Peter Jackson's films, like their iconography and their characters and everything uh, th they, they provided to the cultural images of the Lord of the Rings, people kind of expect that at some point, and, and maybe, of course, artists have, have also that integrated in them. What's the, um, 
in the delivery you guys have to take between relying on it and trusting that people will know these characters that they uh, have known previously and maybe are in their mind in a different way and also creating something new do you rely on, on previous things or you try to to let all of that forget all of that and do something something new right thanks it was very it, I, I was that, that like you just mentioned a bunch of like uh, Uh, spots, right? Like where uh, 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 a bunch of conceptual areas. I basically d d danced <laughs> through each of them. It was very hard for us. Uh, at the beginning, we were trying to purge, right? Because a bunch of the concept art was coming up looking too similar to previous iterations of the, uh, of, of the set. And it's easy to forget because we've seen them for decades that when these adaptations came out, those also were at conflict with, in certain parts, with the original stories. Always critics, always people who say, well, you know, not exactly, and so on. So trying, to, trying for us to come to our own vision, and then when you, once you get to that place of authenticity, and, and that's why I brought in folks like Tyler and Jesper, who know this left and right, uh, once you get to that authenticity, you feel more comfortable balancing different iconography. Because now, now you know your strategy, right? Like, there's a very important phrase. When there is no strategy, every decision will be questioned. So what we did is just set a very solid strategy from the beginning. Yeah, if I could speak to that too, the, the um, I think good creativity comes from constraints, and we had really tight constraints here because yeah. there are, we're surrounded by not only we had to purge our mind of all the vision of Middle Earth that we'd seen already, but we're surrounded by those visions, right? So those are our constraints. How do we make it not that, but this? How do we yep. make it not this, but that? And It, it ended up being, I think our main touchstone was that we wanted Middle Earth to feel more like a gigantic world as opposed to a tiny continent. Yeah. So yep. we, we started to think outside of the sort of, um, I don't know, English-centric view of the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. And we wanted to represent the idea that Middle Earth is actually, you know, has different climates, different... Um, I don't know, landscapes, and it, that yeah. would create all kinds of deeper cultures of a variety of different kinds of peoples, and we wanted to bring that to the forefront in this particular version of Lord of the Rings. And that reflects the world we live in, yeah. right? Like all the faces we see, many types, and we wanted to see that in the set too. Thank you guys. Thank you, David. Thank you. Hello. Um, what an amazing panel this was. Congrats. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, Normally, uh, especially in the spoiler season, when you are taking a look at the cards and see the text of the card, especially in, in this specific Lord of Rings sets, you look at this and say, hey, this is so flavorful, like, this is how I would mechanically see how the, the card would work. But then you look at the art and see, okay, I can, like, this is a great relationship between how the card works and then how it is depicted. Um, you can even see the, the image and say this, the card is going to work like this, and, and you're right. Uh, so I was wondering, what's your relationship with the game design team? Yeah. So, like this, my friend. <laughs> like, we gotta get along. Yeah. Um, uh, on this, we worked with Glenn, who knocked it out of the park. Like the the, the game design here was spectacular, super incredible. We. We talk with game designers, yes, and when the brief for each illustration is written, the writers take the mechanics into account, as they are, and try to bring the world building elements from the, from the very beginning, as I told you. Uh, if you see the murals there with the, the Hobbit areas, we put the patchwork because we knew there was going to be food tokens. So it needs to look, the environment needs to look, okay, yeah, these people make food tokens, right? And say, of course, because they make food, they're going to fight with pants, right? They, they, they're going to use, so you, this starts, that's another constraint. It starts bringing the set together for us. And I will say that tomorrow there is a 
almost the exact same panel, but with R&D. So they'll be speaking yeah. to how to interpret all of this into mechanics too. So that is the two yin and yang of development. So, but yes, I'm glad you enjoyed this half. Yeah. Awesome. Thank, you. Awesome. Thank you. It's Thank you. actually one of my favorite things about working on Magic is the game mechanical str constraints. Yeah. You have to f you have to make imagery that fits these very particular rule sets, and it needs to work in synergy with that. And it, it's really fun. I like those kinds of constraints. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, this will be our last question. Yes, go ahead, please. Hello, thank you very much for having me here. And um, I've got a question related to the one of one ring. So you've got several alternate arts for the one ring, but when you had to make that unique, one of a kind, the one ring, what made you choose that art? Was it specifically chosen because it's, it was not going to be played often because you made it a collector piece, not, not a... Um, you know, game piece, or was it specifically done to evo to evoke the feeling of possessing the true ring, like in physical, like mm. if you were, I don't know, a Frodo? So I, I, uh, I can tell you, if I had opened that, I would have felt like Gollum, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Um, and more formally, talking about work, I remember when uh, Lisa Hansen's team was developing this. It was a print treatment, and there were literally like a wall this size, full of different ways we can do it. Like, full of options. You walk by that. Oh yeah, I've seen it. <laughs> like, it, it was incredible. Like, I'm, because all we, what we had to go from was, was the original piece by Nino, and the, the, the piece is, expresses anger, power, darkness, uh, the unassuming of temptation, right? But they brought it up to another level, right? The, 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 the people who did the print innovation stuff, they really turned it up a notch. And they were like, well, what if, the, what if it's in gold foil, we have the inscription? And what if you do this? And oh, but what if we switch it around? They, they really went through a concept art process in itself mm. when the art was already commissioned. I didn't know you could make it look even better. You know, like it, it's incredible that they really took it up and uh, for those who have seen the One Ring in person, I suppose they must have been very impressed because when I saw the prototypes, I was blown away. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandro. Okay, thank you so much for taking the time. I am very honored. It's been a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed our panel, and I hope you enjoy the event. I'll see you around, okay? Thank stage. you. Oh, yeah. One last announcement. Sorry. Oh, they cut my mic. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. One last announcement. We have a signing tomorrow. If you would like to talk more in detail with, um, the, with Ovidio and Gray and myself, we'll have, a, we'll have a signing tomorrow from 2 to 3.30 right there. Cool? All right, thank you again. <laughs> thank you.